Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to wait just maybe one more minute or so um, and let people continue to file in. Um, but welcome to this Zoom space. Okay. No, oh, people are still filing in. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get started just so you don't have to look at me in silence. Um, welcome everyone to this Montana Book Festival event. Um, it is an MBF Plus event, an off-season event, and it is in partnership with Fact and Fiction Books here in Missoula, Montana. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. Um, I do have a little housekeeping for everyone before I turn it over to our authors tonight. Um, if you're interested in purchasing a copy or copies of Carrie's book, Milltown, what we're talking about tonight, um, I urge you to purchase them from our festival partner, Fact and Fiction, um, who has agreed to donate 10% of all book sales of festival titles like Milltown um, to the festival. So go to factandfictionbooks.com and be sure to enter MBF at checkout and 10% of your purchase will come back to us so that we can continue programming like this. Um, feel free to submit any questions you will eventually have for Carrie, Chris, and or Leif um, via the Q&A &A, at the bottom of your screen. Um, here on the back end of things, I'll be monitoring the chat if you're throwing questions out there, but um, do try to relegate your questions to the Q&A and just kind of conversation to the, the chat function. Um, I'll be throwing out some links in there too and um, you guys can, you know, feel free to chat while the authors are having their conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce you to our authors who you are here for tonight. So I'm going to introduce Carrie, Chris, and Leif. Leif Fredrickson, Fredrickson, pardon, sorry, teaches public history and the history of the American West at the University of Montana. His academic research has been funded by Harvard University's Institute for New Economic Thinking, and his recent dissertation received awards from the Council of Graduate Schools and the Urban History Association. He created and runs the digital public history website, Enviro History. He has also written for the Washington Post, The Guardian, The Conversation, and The Hill. He is currently writing a book about the history of lead poisoning in America, poisoning, I didn't really enunciate that, lead poisoning in America. And many of you will know him as one of the producers of the Death in the West podcast. Chris Latre uh, resides near Missoula, Montana and is a writer of Chippewa Cree Métis descent and an enrolled member of the Little Shell tribe of Chippewa Indians. His first book, One Sentence Journal, short poems and essays from the world at large, won the 2018 Montana Book Award and the 2019 High Plains Book Award. His next book, Becoming Little Shell, much anticipated, will be published by Milkweed Editions in 2022. And Carrie Arsenault is a book critic, book editor at Orion Magazine and a contributing editor at Literary Hub, Lit Hub. She is also a mentor for PEN America's Prison and Justice Writing Program. Her work has appeared in Freeman's, The Boston Globe, Down East, The Paris Review Daily, The New York Review of Books, and Airmail. Milltown, Reckoning with What Remains, is her first book, and it's an amazing book. Carrie received an MFA from the New School and studied in the Master Program in Communication for Development at Malmo, am I pronouncing that right? Malmo, in uh, University in Sweden. <laughs> um, so welcome, Leif, Chris, and Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> that umlaut on the O is hard to say. Malmö, I don't even know. Somebody can pronounce it better than me. <laughs> but, um, hi, guys. Hey. Okay. So I am going to kind of, whatever you call it, moderate this thing, I guess. But Carrie, you know, we've been talking about doing something for your book since before it even came out, like in galley form. Yep. Um, from when I first heard about it, because, you know, Leif and I are both, Missoula guys growing up here. And, you know, while the impact was certainly smaller, there was a time when Missoula was certainly a mill town. Um, 
we were certain, you know, there were multiple mills on the other end of the valley, but certainly kind of that extraction based economy that at one point would have been devastating if it all collapsed at the same time. Um, so that's kind of, to me, what is interesting about this conversation is, you know, the mill where my dad worked for 43 years is right outside of my window. You know, I can look out and see what remains of it and, and just kind of the legacy of it, um, both as uh, employer and the lives that were created and changed when it shut down, as well as the lasting legacy environmentally of the impact that it has left in the valley and the river and, and everything about it. But before we go too deep into that, you want to do maybe like five minutes of just kind of what your book is about. I can do, <clears throat> I can do even less than that. Um, but I, <laughs> but I will, let's see, what can I say? Um, for those who haven't read it, it's, it's a little bit what you just said. And what I would repeat is, it's about uh, this small town where I grew up, three generations of my family worked um, in, uh, about a paper mill in 1901, it opened in Maine. And, but, but sort of underneath that, that story is really about how humans are treated like waste and working class jobs and the dangerous environmentals, environmental legacies that they leave behind in the course of their work. Um, that's what remains, what you just said too, which is the subtitle of the book. Um, <clears throat> you know, they, three generations of my family made paper that was bleached pristine white and in what we threw away in that bleaching process were byproducts so sinister and toxic that they made everybody so ill that our town was nicknamed Cancer Valley. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just the toxics that cause so much grief, I, I would say, although I just found this statistic out, which I thought was terrifying, which the waste that we process, like household waste and everything, 97% of it is toxic. Um, but anyway, once mill workers were used up or became, they became right recycling units for the toxics they produced and they were scrapped too, like grist or thrown away. Um, that's all to say, this is a really fun book. Um, no, it's not a fun, it's, uh, <laughs> it is funny though. I mean, because it is about, it is about a town and it's about people. And it's, um, it's also about me uh, going back to a place that I once loved and reckoning with what that means when I discovered these things about it as an older person and sort of how we interface with home. Um, and, yeah, just, just interrogating what it all means and trying to figure out the relationship of it. So I asked you this before we started and I threatened yeah. that I was going to ask it first and I'm going to is that now that you've written the book and uncovered all these horrible things about the legacy of what your community has leaned on for generations, are you now the town pariah? I am not. I, it's weird. You're not working hard enough. <laughs> I have... It's, people have been so incredibly supportive and it, it doesn't surprise me because the people in this town, after all that's said and done, are really uh, genuine and honest and loving and loyal people. I mean, people I grew up with are still there. You know, my mother was there during, and father during most of it while I was writing the book. And um, there, you know, I, I go there and, you know, of course I'm, I no longer live there. I really haven't lived there since I was 18 and I'm 53 now, so, but I never really feel like an outsider in that way. I feel very comfortable. I mean, there are, there are places, as you see in the book, that I do feel discomfort because I am an outsider. I don't really, I don't, I don't really feel acutely what they feel anymore. I, you know, I'm from the working class, but I, I'm a writer. I don't even know what class that is. Um, <laughs> it's a working class, but a different kind anyway. Yeah, uh, people have been supportive and the most feedback I've gotten has been like, I'm really glad you wrote about this or I, I'm, it's about time somebody wrote about this. And that was really surprising to hear. I thought, you know, I knew people would be supportive because they genuinely do that, but to have people sort of cheer that part of it on felt really, I haven't heard anything negative from people in my town. Maybe they're just not saying anything. That could be, but. I haven't had an event there either yet. Um, 
the internet there is not reliable. A lot of people don't have computers. It's a very poor town. And so I'm waiting until I can get there and do an event um, in person. And then we'll know. And then I'll answer that question more thoroughly. If anybody, right. if like people start throwing rich, rotten fruit at me or something. <laughs> right. Leif, what do you want to hammer with hey. here? Well, I, um, yeah, the book is is really great. It is actually funny in parts of it. I laughed. Out Thank loud. you. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's really it's really compelling um, read, but not in the way that like a lot of these stories are, like the like a civil action or whatever the. Um, oh, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. New or what was the one that came out just about the Dupont case? Um, oh yeah, um, the what? Yeah. Well, these, these these books and movies, it's like a strange illness in town, and there's a shady company, and a protagonist like digs into the boxes and finds a smoking gun. And your your story is not like that, you know. But in a in a lot of ways, I think it's more satisfying than those books are. But I was just interested to hear like, yes, for you to talk about a little bit about that that different kind of narrative arc that you have in your book. I'm so glad you asked that because nobody ever asked that. So thank you. <laughs> um, it's yeah, telling a story about a toxic disaster that is um, basically invisible and slow and ambiguous in nature, pretty much out of sight and out of the news and something that's attritional, like the dioxin that was produced by bleaching paper is attritional, meaning that it as it goes up through your bloodstream, it gets stronger. So like, it's not really what we think of disaster. Like you were talking about, like it doesn't have a central sort of fulcrum or it doesn't have a disaster where something happens. And then I have to go like, I'm like Aaron Brockovich, although I adore Aaron Brockovich. Um, I hope she's not here. I don't mean any harm. Um, <clears throat> that was a great story actually, but um, that's not this story because, um, you know, and so I, I thought about that as I was writing it and like how to write that kind of story, how to write that kind of environmental story specifically. I thought a lot about it um, because there are a lot of environmental disasters like this. I mean, just across the US, think about whatever, you know, fracking or just things that take sort of a long and you can't, you can't find point A leads to point Z, right? So, I couldn't write a story that went from point A. So it went, it went like this, as I was saying, this is the structure of the book and this is the, the shape of the river that I grew up on too. Um, so it, I know that's probably a trope that a lot of people use is like write a story like a river, but it was so fitting because it, it really was a, you know, I, I went through this you follow, for those who haven't read it, you follow me along in the research and trying to uncover what's going on. So it's really a book about me writing the book in a weird way that I thought about only later. So the same kind of sort of attrition that I'm finding in the DNA and in the chemicals was also mirrored in the way I was like compiling the information I was finding. So I use that also to tell that slow attritional story. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense? I don't even know. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah so in, in, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about just environmental storytelling in general and how to tell stories because, you know, I am a book editor, critic and editor at Orion and I get, you know, hundreds of books a month and a lot of them are the same and so they don't stand out and how do you get those stories to stand out unless they're like Aaron Brockovich or Robert Balot's story I can't remember what's the name of that yeah um god that's making me crazy somebody say it um something water um like I just reviewed this book um called Standpipe by David Hardin published by um Belt Publishing that was he was a, a, a volunteer water deliverer in Flint and that was an interesting kind of story to tell. It, it's not just the same thing about Flint and all this, you know, dreadful stuff that's happening. It was it was a him delivering water, and so through that sort of focus, I thought it was a really another interesting way to tell environmental stories. So it's something I'm thinking about a lot. 
So well, I'm glad you asked. The problem with so many like the environmental disaster stories, you know, it's one thing if a reactor melts down and all of a sudden this whole community is being immediately evacuated and it's this huge, you know, action movie end of level boss finale, you know, but so many of them, the whole process is slow that the sickness is slow. The people being ground into meat is slow. And, and nobody, we don't really like slow. You know, we're not interested in right. slow. Yes. So it's like the, when it comes to the, you know, especially climate change, you know, there's so many things with all the stats and the dates and, and, and I think people's eyes roll up in their head. And when you humanize it by focusing it on a family and the effects that it has had, you know, generational or the water deliverer, you know, that type yeah. of thing. I think with, with the story, it's almost like the, the disaster has to be almost a subtext to the story of this human story that can grab our attention. And I think that's where you succeed and other people maybe fail is because it becomes too much like a, like a dissertation and a not- Polemic or something, yeah. yeah. I mean, did well, you, I, con, were you cognizant of that while you were writing it? I really was. I, I, mean, I thank you for calling it successful. And that wasn't what I was saying. I was like, I'm writing the story that nobody else can write. I wasn't really saying that, but it's something I really was thinking about because I don't know if you've got, either of you have read, um, uh, Rob Nixon's book, Slow and Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor. It's a really incredible text. It's a literary critique. Uh, and I read that a while ago. And so I was writing it. it. It calls it slow violence, this kind of attritional violence, you know. Um, and he looks at these things as violences, not just disasters, and how he kind of goes through it and, and tries and just kind of like pokes at how to tell this story. And I really did think about that. And I'm so glad that you think about that too, because I feel not alone anymore in that. Um, well, in but, way, you know, like like the mill here, right, while my dad worked there, there were four different owners. What and kind of I, mill was it? Sorry. It, it was, well, it started at a Horner Waldorf plant. Okay. And, and then it was Champion. And then it was Stone Container. And then they merged with Smurfit and became Smurf at Stone. And now whoever owns it now that is dealing with all the fallout, I mean, it's a super fun site. It just hasn't gotten the official designation because they've managed to stiff arm it at every turn. And, and But it is, it's a super fun site. And the people who are most responsible, probably in the, you, know, you go back to Horner Waldorf probably in Champion is when like the worst, and Leif, you probably know this better than I do as far as the, the worst environmental shit that was happening were in those early days because ours what was like 58 or something like that is when it was founded is when it was built oh yeah. really yeah it, it was a it was a paper mill a craft paper mill so very similar so same yeah, yeah. It, it uh, was, okay. oh sorry go ahead no you go so, yeah they, they came in and they were like there won't be any pollution and like within a year there was a massive fish kill in the Clark of course um i don't you know it's something you just said too chris was and then I want to get back to what you just said about fish too. Um, the the environmental storytelling, you know, I think you're right on when the heart of a story is really the heart. You have to get to a heart. It has to be, and it's not just like you use a person to like quickly tell a story. I think the story is about the person and all that, like you said, comes from it. You know, you start with a human being and outspins everything from that you know, in a person, as we were talking about before, or Leif was, and I were talking, one person can spin out to tell a universe, you know, um, and, and it has to be, a, it has to be human. I mean, you know, I read story, I get so many natural histories and stories about fish and everything. And it's like, I care about fish, but like, um, you know, it's, I need to feel like some kind of love, really. Like, it's really hard to love a fish in the same way as you love a human, right? Yeah, I mean, that that's funny you say that because that was actually one of the, when that the mill, the mill here at Frenchtown, um, the first kind of activism around it was like sportsmen who were concerned about the fish. Which is great. Women's groups emerged in the 60s that were like, what about all the air pollution that's harming children in this area and stuff? And they, they were explicitly critical of that sort of focus on the fish kind of. God, that's an interest. That could be an interesting essay. It's like 
the sportsmen, the fish and the women with the air pollution. I bet there's like, I bet you could go through history and find like groups everywhere, like focused, same groups focused on the same issues everywhere. It's true. And I thought about that too. In one, in one chapter in the book, there are, you know, they spent, they spent a lot of time testing the fish. And as I was researching, I'm like, God damn it, why don't they test the people? <laughs> like they never did that. It was always like, let's test and see how much toxicity is in this fish. And it's, I know it's an indicator species and I know, I know, I understand what that means, but at the same time, it's like, you know, what about the people? Um, there's well, still- Your class recently did that study and you show, they posted a bunch of photos from like the seventies, right? Wasn't it the seventies where the air pollution was so bad. And the funny thing is, is that I can remember smelling it. I don't remember the air pollution being that bad growing up. I mean, it looked like like on a regular day, like it does here when we have fires in the area and the smoke is that bad. You know, I have these memories associated, associated with the smell, like my dad opening his lunchbox and smelling. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, exactly. All of his stuff. And, and now, you know, however long it's been, 30 years, 40 years later, that's what I remember. I don't remember just the, fog and and filth in the air do you still have his lunchbox i don't yeah because i smelled somebody's lunchbox i know that sounds weird to everybody but lunchboxes were like kind of a big thing we, everybody right i remember oh, smelling yeah. one and it, it, it like totally smelled like my father like i remember that smell so distinctly it was like dead air i don't know how to explain it it's hard to explain smell really but yeah, it was. Um, it certainly had a, a very specific odor, <laughs> for oh, sure. Odor. I like the French accent. On that one. Uh -huh. Speaking yeah. of French, so that's that's another. You know, we were talking about the invisibility and sort of the, the slow kind of disaster, and that was the other. You know, as I began this book, I was investigating really first genealogy, and then. It, became parallel I was investigating envir environmental disaster but the but the two things really parallel each other in that same kind of invisibility um, because my uh, family came from Acadia and French Canada and the rec the things that I found out about my family history I hadn't known either like the ethnic cleansing of Acadians in 1755 from the maritime provinces and how they were basically like killed and run out of the country because they were like Catholic and French shoved into corners of their, you know, own land, um, you know, and, 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 to, and to put, to sort of look at that his history and then sort of pull it forward to the current day. You know, my, I should tell everybody, a lot of those people long story short, ended up in my hometown. It's a very Acadian and French Canadian based town, a lot of them. And so to take that history and pull it forward too was part of that, looking at that invisibility or silent voices and things that people didn't say or talk about or, or even know, like me as a kid, I didn't even know like part of that. Um, so I don't know what I'm saying about that. Oh, well, it was interesting too to relate it to the mill. Like New England and Acadians themselves were really the backbone of the Industrial Revolution, which I found out like it was such a huge percentage of Acadians that came during the Industrial Revolution from like, I can't remember the number because I have a bad memory as I was saying, but it was a lot from 1860 to like 19, I don't know, 10 or 20 a lot they basically built the mills up and down the east coast and worked at them well aren't the acadians now the cajuns in in louisiana um it's a different crowd actually it's so those people they didn't go directly there from the um the the ethnic clan they weren't they they i think that a lot of them went to france first or they went to different maybe some islands and then came up so they weren't direct um from the cleansing mm -hmm. and that was another history like it was sort of this book was a little bit of correction too to some histories like sure. I, I take that I don't really get into the Louisiana thing but I just present what really happened and where all those people came 
like a correction to that and you know Anne of Green Gables and like that's what everybody thinks about when they think about Prince Edward Island but Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I thought this, I mean, I thought that history of Acadians was really fascinating. And um, I think, like, I do a lot of research in environmental justice, and it tends to be focused a lot on race or on class. And but this was an interesting story more about ethnicity. I mean, it's also about class, too, obviously, and mm -hmm. maybe even race to some extent in terms of how Acadians were initially seen, but this really interesting story of um, ethnic ethnic group that was disproportionately exposed to these toxic chemicals and stuff as a result of their work and their communities, and also your discussion, which I wanted you to to expound on a little bit about, like how um, to get back a little bit to like the history of um, groups that have a opposed or fought aspects of pollution. Yeah. Not a big part of the story you tell, but, and part of that has to do with the ethnicity, at, at least from what I gathered from your book there. I think so. I mean, you know, it's, it's not a big jump to say that, you know, um, Acadians were French Catholic. They were brought up to be um, loyal and subservient to God or whatever, um, and hardworking, you know, all the things you would want in a, a blue collar worker, right? Like really they were, you know, and, and sort of practical. I mean, I'm very much all of those things myself. <laughs> I wouldn't say subservient, well, maybe, I don't know. But like, I, I, I can see those lines very distinctly drawn from me to those ancestors. And, and so what happened when they, they came to work in the mills, they sort of were like, they put their nose down, and they worked. And they really weren't interested in being management. They just kind of wanted to do their sort of independent, more independent thing because that's what they had done in Prince Edward Island since like 1602 or something. I mean, they were there for a long time and they, they had a culture very distinct that they built from France, which I also found really interesting. Like even their language is very different. Um, so they brought those elements, I think, with them, and they were exploited by by um, by by mill owners and mill managers. And it's not to say that they were necessarily, you know, it's a complicated thing. It's not to say that, you know, these are victims and they were exploited. But then I sort of go into that too: is like, did they have a choice? You know, was the American dream really an American dream? And if so, who was it really for? You know, I mean at the beginning of the century, systemically, like everybody rose because just things got better. You know, they had clean water and like, like everybody's life improved in a way. But then, you know, once sort of that settled out for a minute, then it's sort of the, the division of, of class started happening and it's just been getting further and further apart since. It really, I mean, if you, if you ask me, which nobody's asking, but I'll say, <laughs> I don't know if there was an any American dream, everybody would, you know, some people would argue, well, they came from a different country and look what they, you, you know, I went to college and I got an education and I'm doing better than they did in that way. But that's also, a, you know, but they were getting poisoned while they did it. And also, I would also argue that getting an education doesn't have to be the sign of success, you know, um, I think that is part, part of the problem in our country is that we see that as success. So inherent in that is an insult to people who don't get an education, like the working class. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, when are we gonna start valuing that? You know, um, so when people say, oh, you got an education, you, well, is that better? Like, who's deciding that that's even better? Um, Anyway, well, it's better because I'm not working in a mill and getting poisoned, sure. But it just sort of, theoretically, I think America needs to start thinking about that, especially with the um, working class of America and manufacturing being gutted. What are we gonna do with these people who are loyal and good working and et cetera, et cetera, all the things I said. Like, is there a place for them in this society? And if you look at the way the last presidential election went, no, there is no place for them. They were pissed. 
Well, it's interesting, you know, tracing industry and in, like in certain areas. And when you start thinking about kind of what you brought up as far as learning your family history and the Acadians it is who was the workforce, you know, so whether we're talking about Butte and the, and the copper mining there or, you know, there were a lot of my people from Hill 57 that were in Great Falls that were working in the smelter in Black Eagle. Mm -hmm. And I kind of used that same trope. I don't know if I'd call it a trope, but at least path to, you know, you know, my dad just being the next generation of like Métis people, which I am, who in this valley found work here, whether they were trappers and guides, which we were all over the valley doing that. And then even like, it's the Frenchtown mill, you know, and I grew up in Frenchtown and we were always told that it was because French people lived there. But the reality is, is it was a Métis town that scattered all over, you know, my kind of mentor, Nicholas Ruman called it the Métis archipelago, where our people scattered huh. all these different little towns and, and created new towns um, based on where they came from. So like Frenchtown, there's a old book that has a census from 1860 and it lists all the people and by race and there's two white guys, one Indian and the rest are all listed as half breed. And, you know, growing up. Wow. Interesting. All these family names that, that are connected to back when like Chicago and Green Bay were Métis trading posts are all family names that I were people I grew up with. So like we were all connected mm. And we had no idea. We had no, no idea that we were kind of sprang from the same kind of place. Um, Are you it, connected now to like, to people? A little Are bit. I mean, that's, we're talking about your book, not mine, <laughs> but that's yeah. kind of the story of it is, is, is tracking that down, you know? Mm. And I think you could, I think you could do that in any community. It's particularly where there's any kind of industry or extractive yeah. industry. You know, I, I was talking to someone up in the Swan Valley and, and there was question as to, you know, how much indigenous input do they need for things that they're doing? Is there proof that they're even there? And, you know, from my point, it's like, as long as there were furry animals there up until about 1840, I know we were there, you know, it's just the, the records keep record keeping is different for among wow. people and just all of it. it, it it's, 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 there's some things you almost have to take on, you know, if it's, if it's smoky and hot, it's probably a fire, you know? That's, you know, that whole aspect of record keeping too. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember that about the book, but that's something too that I, I made corrections. You know, this whole book started with uh, obituary and my grandfather's death certificate that I was like, oh, I didn't know any of that. And then I, I started following the, the, the lines of it and found out most of it was wrong, you yeah. know? Um, so the record keeping of, you know, then I was like, well, what, what is real? Like, what is the fact? So then I'm like, I'm going to go to France. I'm going to go to Prince Edward Island. I'm going to go to the main DEP, you know, the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm like, I'm going to try to find like what the truth is and come to find out that's about as evasive as, as everything. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, the, the, if the rec, if the basic records like death and birth are wrong, like everything in between is messed up. And, and, and that's part of, I think it's, it's, it's a huge part of the problem. I mean, not just record keeping, but like what that whole idea between, you know, our, everybody's war on the truth here and maybe maybe it has something to do with the papers that they're filing away i don't know have you ever experienced that in your research either of you like just oh, finding yeah. stuff that was uh, just wrong yeah well i mean it it um i mean one of the things i thought about you know i mean like uncertainty is such a underlying theme of that of your book and um uh I think it's really, I mean, it's just interesting, like, to, I mean, to get back to a little bit like we were talking about with um, activism and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here in Missoula, the activists that emerged were white middle-class women who were educated, who were stay-at-home moms, and they had a lot of resources and time to invest in it. And that's just like, you worked on this for what, 10 years? <laughs> it's like, yeah. 
very difficult. Like it's not, it's not um, better for people to have like higher education or whatever, but it makes them more vulnerable to these sorts of things. It's just an incredibly complicated, like it really is a serious barrier to like democratic involvement in like policy. It, it is, that's such a good point. And I, I thought about that too, when I was specifically in a chapter where I was talking about food insecurity, where like four to five kids in our town now are food insecure. But, you know, she was like, you know, there were, so many people are like, oh, the government shouldn't be feeding these people. Shame on the parents. And I'm, I'm like, these parents, there's no work. And if they have to work, they have to go 20 miles out of town. And what if they don't have a car because they don't have any money? There's certainly no bus service. I don't know about in the, probably in the wilds of Montana, there's not a lot of bus service either, right? You know, and so never mind getting to that pretend job that's 20 miles away and, and like, what if they don't even have a stove? I mean, there's just so many comp layers of like complications for people feeding their children. It was just like that whole idea about, about being, my point is, how are you going to be an activist when you like can't even yeah. cook a meal or, yeah. or, you know, but I think with the, that was another thing I wanted to try to do with the book. And I think Chris, your first question, it goes back to that was, I want to write a book about people that I grew up with and then they'll read that book. So they don't have to do all the work. Here, I did the work for you. I read a book about people like you and me and working class people. And I want, they're my main audience. I want them to read it. Like, mm -hmm. sure, I would love if policymakers read it and said, let's do something or whatever. But like, really, this is for those people so that they don't have to do the footwork and that they can be at least more aware I mean, this isn't a book that says, go do something, but it's like, here's some information. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Well, for one, yeah. back to Montana, I'm pretty sure our new government governor believes Jesus wrote a velociraptor to work every day. That's kind of the state of things in Montana right now. I mean, no joke. I mean, he's like a creative, creative, what do you call him? Creationist museum financer or something like that. But one question I have, like, like, like the rabbit holes of research that you fall down. I mean, there are times I'll go to look one thing up and like two hours later, I've got a ton of information that I know I'm not going to use because of who I'm writing the book for. I'm not, you know, the, the, the high level kind of, uh, you know, really detailed dates and names and, and academic type stuff has already been written. And I'm trying to write it for people who don't know their story. Right. Like when my first book came out and I would do events and talk about being Little Shell and people who've lived in Montana their whole life would say, well, who, who I've never heard of the Little Shell. And I'm like, I'm like, it was so frustrating, you know, we've been here forever, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I get that idea of, of trying to write for your audience and, and tell them stories that maybe they didn't hear, but did you struggle with, with God, this is such great information, but it just really is too much. Footnotes. No, but I, no, but really it was like, it was really hard. I, I wanted to include because everything felt so important, you know, mm -hmm. like I have barrels of documents. That, so what I did was sort of like vegetarian cooking, right? Like do, I'm not no, a vegetarian. I I, I'm not a vegetarian, but pretend, pretend you are for a second. Right. So, so you, you have all these carrots and potatoes and you're like peeling everything. And you have this pile, after you're done, you have this pile of peeling here and then the vegetables are here. So like all the peelings, I, I went through all the peeling, you know, I peeled everything. Um, I guess is to say that I had to read a lot to get down to trying to write a story that doesn't have all that in it. And like, sometimes, I mean, that's why it took so long and to put, put details in it with dates and all this stuff that I felt like, you know, I felt like a reporter sometimes, but then I would put it in and I would just basically strip it out. Um, you know, I, I would suggest if you're writing that, put it in there and then just later footnote it. Like, cause at least it's there so you can refer to it and think about it as you're telling your story, but then I would just move it or, you know, and, and my readers were like, you know, people, a lot of people would just kind of get a little, sleepy when they would read that. So I, I did a lot of things in bullet points so that you could either read them or you could skip them. Some of those data points that I thought were important, um, you know, like all the crazy things that were happening in the 1980s around dioxin, which is the 
sort of main toxic in my book. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, well, I have another question about your yeah. your sort of historical okay. process. Like, I often think, you know, there there are benefits and drawbacks to being like an insider or an outsider to some subject. Mm. Things that you have blind spots and you see things from either perspective. I think, and you're kind of both in these case in this book. But I was just curious if there was aspects that you felt like you either had a really good perspective on or things or things that you found like, or worried you had blind spots about or found out later you had blind spots about while you're writing it kind of. Yeah, I think that was also part of the structure. Well, that was actually the plot of the book, weirdly, was me leaving home and coming back. That was literally the plot, everybody, big giveaway. <laughs> it's going and coming and going and coming, but that, but that sort of recursiveness, um, was a de- is a departure and a return, right? So every time I would come home, I would touch upon again, like what home means. And sort of at the same time, I would be, you know, I would ask a new question to myself or think about things in a new way. Like, you know, what does it mean to be, come from this place that doesn't love you back? What does it mean to consider yourself part of the working class when you don't even have a job? Or like, what does it mean to leave a place and then return a place that has defined you? So it was like, that, that actual movement between the proximity and the distance underlined how I was this insider and outsider, right? But it also underlined, like I also felt like, because I have 30 photographs in the book, like I was a witness and a participant to the crime too, because not just in photography, but like I had been complicit. We're all complicit in a lot of ways to these kind of crimes, let's just say. Um, and I was a critic and an advocate. So I felt like I was on the edge of a lot of those things all the time. And I, I think the, you know, the one thing where it sort of came, the one time it came to a head is, um, is when I got involved uh, intimately with, a, like started a water activist group in town. So this is not straight journalism, people. I was like, I'm involved. And, you know, it's a fantasy to say any, any journalist or any writer, it's a fantasy to say you got involved. I mean. Not to say that I didn't tell the truth, but there's this this desire to tell a different story or another kind of truth, which was really what I was driving at. It was like, okay, I can't find the truth in the papers. I can't link dioxin to cancer. I can't do this or I can't do that. So what's the other truth that I can find? You know, what what does that mean? Um, So the, yeah, becoming an activist uh, in my town was good for a little while and then it wasn't so good (laughs) because the thing that I realized was that I'm not feeling as acutely what they are feeling. You know, I'd go home to my nice house in Connecticut and they're there like with poverty all around and with water, you know, Nestle coming in to take their water supply. Basically it was what I should tell everybody what was happening. Um, Um, yeah, it was it was really hard for me. You know, I, they they basically I should tell people they booted me out of the, my own group that I started. They were like, "Yeah, we don't need you anymore." And I was like, "What?" I was really upset. And sometimes once in a while I still get like mad. But then I'm like, "Well, it's not really my thing. It's just like I wouldn't go back to this town and say, here's what you should do." You know, people always ask me that, like, "What would you do to fix the town?" I'm like, I don't know. I wrote this book. It's your turn. <laughs> like, you do. It's not my problem. I mean, it is and it isn't, but. It's, it, the book was really to reveal, not prescribe, I think. Well, I mean, I know like I sometimes, there's a level of hypocrisy that I live with being, sure. you know, so angry at industry and the, and the scars that they leave behind on the land and, and the people. And at the same time, you know, I had a pretty damn good life because my dad was working at the mill, you know, we were working class and we didn't have a lot of money, but we didn't, we didn't go hungry. You know, I always had some smoky hoopty to drive when I was in high school. You know, I wasn't, you know, the rich kid driving a Mustang, but, you know, my 64 Ford got us around, you know, you know, stuff like that. And, and, uh, you know, we're lucky now that, you know, the mill is gone. So you, it's, I don't really, and I, you know, I don't really even know anybody who's left that worked there. It's been what, 11 years, I think, since it shut down. So you, 
I don't, I don't worry about that finger pointing hypocrisy. Like maybe if it was still cranking away that, that yeah. cause you know, I can remember people, you know, the, whatever environmental organization it was unfurling these big banners off the big catwalk thing that went across and my dad, Oh, those goddamn environmentalists. And, rah, rah, rah. and I, by then I was already like, well, they, you know, yeah. You're like, but, you know? but, but it's not hypocrisy. I mean, you, that's the one thing about, I feel like our society is weird. Like we can hold two things together. Like I can want the mill to succeed while criticizing it. Like I can, we can do both. Like we can, we can want progress. Like I'm sure you do. We're envi- we're, I would consider us probably environmentalists to some degree. I don't know. I, I guess if we care about the environment. That's basically my definition of it. Um, mm-hmm. But we can still want progress and we still have computers and we still like, we all carry that sort of complicity or hypocrisy or whatever with us and we can hold it. It's just my, I think the thing that I would like people to look at, I know you guys do, is like, what do we value about that? Like, what, what's more valuable, like life or death? You know, maybe make decisions on that kind of shit than like um, uh, um, tax dollars and blah, 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 or something. Sure, tax dollars, but be creative leaders. And like, and so, I feel like this book, the only thing it can do like that is to educate people enough or to open their eyes enough to like choose better leaders that will do better things for them in that way. Like if you don't end up voting for like velociraptors people or or like that lady in Georgia or whatever. I'm sorry, but you know, we have to deal with reality here. Um, I don't know. So I have a a question that's a little bit along the same lines, but um, I we just I just got done working on this podcast about Butte, which is a mining town <clears throat> that my dad is from. It has a yeah. lot of similarities, uh, you know, a lot of environmental issues, and then a dying industry. And, and part of that, we were talking. We talked to a journalist who's from Butte, and um, she was mentioning that now what they often do with these big mining sites is they bring the workers don't live around the mine anymore. They bring them there. And so you don't have, you don't develop a, a mining town with all the problems, right. with it, but you also don't, you wouldn't have had Butte, you know, which is an amazing place. Yeah. That made me think about like what, uh, cause there's a lot of things that these places produce besides just the actual products like paper and copper and stuff right. that are in some ways rooted in that hardship that's from them in that, that made, I just, I don't know, that, that's probably an unfair question, <laughs> but I just, it, it was something that made me stop and think for a minute. No, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure what your question is, but I'm thinking about, I mean, are you, are you asking, what are you asking exactly? Well, I guess me. Is how could things have been different and would we want them to be oh. so different that you wouldn't have had a mill town? Oh, right. Yeah. I don't know. I'm with Chris too. I, I had a wonderful childhood, like, I mean, maybe his isn't wonderful. I don't know if he used that word, but I did. I had a, I have zero complaints about my childhood, except maybe I didn't get like the new basketball sneakers every year, like everybody did, but I, we didn't go without. My father, you know, put four to five of us through college on his mill worker salary. And for most of those years, my mother didn't work only in the eighties when things started to go south for the working class, did she go back to work? Um, you know, yeah, they, I mean, they certainly they sacrificed, but we weren't eating like canned beans every night. I mean, maybe we were, I don't know, looking back, that's another thing. It's that whole kind of like, what, back to your question too, is what was it, you go back to a place and you're like, you remember what it was like, but then you're like, was it really like that? Or did I want it do i want it to be a certain way or do i just remember these things in, a, in one way or another like how was it really it's really hard to say and then you look at pictures which is another way which is why i'm really interested in photography and history and looking at like i stare at them and try to like you know, I, there's a bunch of photos on my website my family photos and i look at that i'm like god our house looks really kind of dumpy or something not dumpy my mother would kill me she was as clean as a pin but like I don't know. It just doesn't look very, um, but we didn't know who cares. We had like, I don't know. It was a great childhood. Um, 
That whole thing of bringing in workers from somewhere else, though, I just it's so weird. Yeah. I have a visceral negative reaction to that. I mean, because that's it's like another resource. That's man camps on the Bakken, you know, that's man camps that were fur trading posts. You know, you bring people in and they just rip the hell out of it, and the people who are already there and they leave and they don't care about it. So uh, you know, it's yeah. almost it's almost like that's industry's response to say, you know, we don't want communities to grow up around, you know, you don't want the company town either, but at the same time, people who live somewhere and work there are invested in, you know, right. making it a nice place to live. And I feel like we had that here, you know, maybe I'm just naive and I'm just remembering seeing it all through rose colored glasses, but you know, as long as you could get a gas mask to go outside with, everything was fine. I know we were being poisoned, but I had a great childhood. Right, That's right. the conundrum, right? We were so, like being, but no, you're right. It, you know, people, if you're bringing in people, there, there's no investment. And it's like, maybe right. that's part of the trick too. It's like, well, they're not going to unionize or they're not right. going to, you know, fight back and nobody's going to start an activist group. They're just going to go in and do their job and leave. That's really, that's like really sad. That makes me really sad. And who can? They're like, who cares who the town leaders are? You know, there's nobody cares about anything. That is just, that's like, that sounds like something that happened in like a Mad Max film or something. <laughs> Jesus. <Yeah. laughs> right? That's terrible. Um, there's a question on the board. Or, or, yeah, I, I guess it's about time to the, for that, isn't it? I mean, we don't have to. I just saw it. It popped up into my hat, and we, you guys can jump in too. This is from Jacqueline Brennan, where it's 2:42 a.m. It says, "I'm curious if Carrie has come across situations where some of that shoddy record keeping she alluded to, especially around causes of death for working class people, has been a barrier to redress." I'm thinking particularly particularly about folks who die or contract long-term illness after exposure to toxins from long careers in extractive industry. Would love hearing anything she's learned or come across on the subject. Um, I'm thinking particularly about um, um, I'm not sure what the question, could somebody help me figure out what the question is? Was the lack of record bearing keeping a barrier to you really learning the truth, I guess, is if that's what I'm reading. Yes. I mean, I looked at a lot of death records, especially as like a sort of obsessed genealogist. <laughs> I look at them and there's a whole chapter in my book, Jacqueline, I think it's called, I can't remember what it's called. It, it, it Actually, I think it's published on LitHub as an excerpt. Um, which you can find. It's about me looking at my father's death certificate. My father who died in the middle of me writing this book of cancer too. Um, and it's looking at his death certificate and they say, you know, like died of this as a underlying condition of this as an underlying condition of that. They have like four underlying conditions, right? So it's like a joke because what was the actual cause of the death? It actually, it's these layers again of like sort of invisibility of like, what did he actually die of? I mean, most people you read in the deck they died of pneumonia or they died of like sepsis or they died of something, but not the actual thing. Like he had cancer that he got from working in the paper mill. Is that on his death certificate? No, it's not. So like, that is a problem because they just put the actual moment of death. You know, they might put the underlying cause, you know, they didn't even put, he had had uh, a triple bypass back in his, 50s I think and that wasn't an underlying cause maybe it was why didn't they put that you know there's a whole anyway it's a whole like kind of insane chapter near the end of the book where I start to really look at those records and the main department of environmental protection records because part of that problem too is the record keepers can unconsciously have an agenda too you know I mean this whole business about the Acadians too. There's there's no records. They they could read and write. There are no records about what they saw. It all came through the eyes of the general or whoever he was that like killed them all. So like, what's the pers what's what really happened? Um, is still kind of up for grabs a little bit. You know, people triangulate, and that's what Leaf was saying a little bit about. Or we were talking about how how to go home again and you sort of you can you try to triangulate a shape of what you think things were based on 
records based on talking to people based on and this is how I did it based on going to France based on so all these records I I I went through and got different kinds of records other than just that evidence that is literally wants not to be found like well, we see that with COVID too yeah he died of a heart attack because he had COVID right Right. So this is like so what it still happens. It's still happening. It's still happening. Yeah. It, 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 records are just one kind of unit of evidence. You know, I used to be a paralegal too, which this, I looked at it like that. It was like building an evidence, building a case, like, or one you would watch on like British mysteries or whatever crime shows. But um, there's all sorts of evidence out there. It's just like, again, Leaf said, who has time to do that <laughs> when you're working nine to five and trying to feed five kids like my parents, you know, mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know. And what evidence gets kind of elevated over others? I mean, this goes back to a little bit what you were talking about, Chris, I mean, with indigenous history where you have a strong oral tradition and it's been long dismissed <laughs> in favor of, you know, white record keeping and that sort of thing. Right. No, that's exactly right. Elevated is a good way to put it. Um, you know, even in the town hall I went to look at, those were records, the historical society in my town. You know, everything in there is like laudatory about the mill's founder. I just wanted to find one sort of like shred of humanity about him, like said he, I don't know, something, but it was nothing. It was just all praise, praise. And there's like statues everywhere, you know, this, that. And that's another whole thing about it's the record keeping or the memorializing of, of these people that um, extract things from the earth, but we never memorialize the consequences of those extractions. And it's something I'm working on. Uh, another project that I, I won a grant for with the Architect League of New York. I know that sounds weird, but there's gonna be a, a piece coming out February 5th where I reimagine all the memorials in Rumford. And I give them new, different life to show really what what we should be memorializing or memorializing to take that word out of its context, but meaning like paying attention to, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I'm. I'd love to talk to you more about that because yes, my dissertation was on lead poisoning, and I that's how I kind of concluded it as well. There's all these memorials there's the shot tower where they make they made lead shot and stuff but there's no you're so proud of it right you're like it killed so many people <laughs> it's hard you have to think like how do you this invisible thing mostly invisible doesn't really smell like anything or taste like anything and... oh let's talk about that because i'm a i'm kind of obsessed with memorials as you probably if you go through my book you could like circle them all there there's a lot like paul bunyan yeah, like the biggest example of it is this giant. We have one of those giant. You probably have one in Montana too. Who knows? Giant Paul Bunyan. It was like with this big axe. You know, everybody's like, he's so cool. I'm like, what? <laughs> Ed Muskie was from our town. Ed Muskie, who penned the Clean Air and Water Act. Where's his goddamn statue? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. Like the Paul Bunyan thing is such a perfect. I know. Isolation of what memorialization has been. But. It's so amazing. He's like chopping down the trees and there's Muskie. He's got like a, his memorial in our town. This is no joke. It's like a granite thing with like dates. It looks like a grave site. It's not where he's buried, but it's like he's, he stands for life actually. And like, and then this guy with the ax, I don't know. It's all messed up. So I'm really kind of obsessed with that. <laughs> But yeah, we did a, we did a new, this girl and this um, girl, this woman friend of mine, and I did a map, a reimagining of the tourist sites in Rumford in Mexico that's going to be published by the Architect League pretty soon. <laughs> online. It'll be online. So. Uh-huh. But it'll be an actual like tour you could take of the town. It's an interactive map. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, she's a good, she's a great graphic designer and art director. And so you click on it and expand. Yeah, it's a map and everything. Um, and I would actually like to implement it in the town itself. Mm -hmm. But wait, do you see what's in there? So cool. I don't know. That's really cool. Yeah, we'll see. Um, there's Any Charlotte. other questions before we? Yeah, there's one right here by Charlotte Freeman. It sounds like what you're talking about is a history of the consequences of capitalism, post-capitalist studies along lines. 
answer, yes, <laughs> I, I am. I mean, this, um, this town, you know, 40, 50 years, the past 40, 50 years, especially, you know, I, I sort of go through the, this town is a microcosm of what has happened to America, right? Industry, the rise of the working class, whatever, middle class, you know, uh, you go through the 70s, the oil crisis, the 80s, you know, there's suddenly uh, companies become people. Um, Milton Friedman writes his treatise and everything changes and the Berlin Wall comes down. I mean, it's all kind of in this book, actually. And, and it, and Don't the town... forget, first you kill the natives, then you build your town and your industry. Right. That's, yes. the America, that's the America we forget about. First, you got to eradicate everybody who's there first. But my, my family didn't do that. My family married them. <laughs> and yeah, that's in my blood. They're in my blood, in the, the Micmac in, uh, in Acadia. And so they didn't do that. So I feel pretty good. I mean, not that side of the family anyway, the other side, that's another book, but, um, but yeah, but true. The first they kill the mop um, and then they do all that. And it, yeah, it's really just a microcosm at, at a, and, and it just subverts the idea of Maine. I think people um, think Maine is such a pristine spot and I'm here to say it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm back. Um, that, I felt like that was a really good uh, line to end on. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Maine is this really pristine spot. It's not. It's like a really weird <laughs> spot there that made. I'm a terrible human being. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that hour went by so fast. I can't believe it's seven o'clock. Um, I, I guess I'll give you know the audience one more chance to throw a question into the Q and A. Um, I mean, I also put my um, email up. Oh, yeah. against, my, against my better judgment, but I will, if anybody has any questions, I will not read your manuscript. So that's about it. Um, <laughs> some people send me that. So now I say, I will not read it. If you have any more questions or if you have information to give me even better <laughs> and leaf you and I will continue talking about our obsessive and Chris, I think we should, we just should do this once a month talk. We have so much yeah. in common. Uh, thank you, Carrie, Leif, Chris, for being here with us tonight. And thanks to everyone watching and participating. Uh, just a reminder, you can purchase Carrie's book, Milltown, from Fact and Fiction Books. I threw the link in the, in the, um, the chat box for you. Um, and remember to enter MBF at check, checkout so that 10% of your purchase will come back to us so that we can continue programming events like this one. Um, you can also go to montanabookfestival.com. There you can purchase merchandise um, and you can also donate again so that we can continue events like this one. Um, again, Carrie, Leif, Chris, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Have a great night. Thank you. I hate this part. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a like weird this. part too. It's an awkward part. I'm going to wait till everybody's gone. I'm going to stay last. <laughs> wait till you're all gone. <laughs> I could just stay See, now is when we'd go out and get a beer or something. Yeah. When the paperback comes out, I'm leaving home and never coming back. So <laughs> maybe I'll see you then. But yeah, let's keep talking about um, lead. Yeah. 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 Is this is, you? Um, oh, bye. We have to go. Yeah, okay. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stop recording now.